So good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on sustainable returns management. My name is Aline Mulik and I'm Public Affairs Manager for International and European Affairs at BVH. And I'm also the co-author of BVH Returns Compendium, which is available online and in which we um, collected the latest studies and figures about returns and looked at this phenomenon from various different angles. Dealing with returns is, as we all know, a challenge for all retailers, be it online or offline. And that's why I'm extremely happy to look a bit deeper into this topic today with two real experts on this topic who will show us what sustainable returns management can look like. Welcome, Richard Loretto. Richard um, joined Amazon four years ago and is director for circular economy at Amazon's EU sustainability team based in London. And as the best return is the one that does not happen, he will show us what preventive measures Amazon is taking to reduce the amount of returns. And welcome Alexander Lange. Alexander is responsible for the business development of Bybay in Germany. And as Bybay processes and sells returns and overstocks for retailers, e-tailers, distributors, and brands, you will show us today how to set up a sustainable returns process and how to deal with returned items to ultimately even be, make, be able to make profit from them. We will listen to both presentations and then we'll start a short Q&A with Richard and Alex. And we invite all of you to join the discussion and ask any questions that you might have. Let's get started with returns prevention and the way Amazon is handling returns. The floor is yours, Richard. Thank you very much. Okay, so th thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yes, as uh, Celine talked about, the we're addressing this webinar in the flow of returns. And so therefore I'm kicking off with um, the returns prevention. Um, and Alexander from, from Bybay will then look at the downstream's returns management piece to, just, just after me. Um, in this few slides, I'm going to cover three areas. Uh, basically, uh, a piece that covers that returns are a fundamental part of the retail business, not just the, the, the e-commerce um, or a company like Amazon, but thousands of, of very small to very large retailers all over the world. It's a fundamental part of, of the ecosystem. Um, and therefore, it's about how do we optimize and how do we improve the overall system uh, to 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 make sure we uh, reduce uh, the amount of returns that uh, get get um, disposed of or end up uh, in incineration. Uh, the, the second element we'll look at is the focus on returns prevention and some areas that we do uh, working with internally ourselves with our vendors and sellers. And then the third side is then how we use the the data that we have, which is one of the benefits of e-commerce. Uh, to be able to either um, feedback to to vendors and 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 sellers and and how to improve um, or fee forward ourselves into the shopping experience uh, and the and the customer experience. As I said, returns are a fundamental part of the retail business. You know, we're a retailer like many others. Um, you know, customers make errors, products aren't perfect, um, and supply chains damage stuff either outward. Um, or even on on the return re re reverse logistics side, you know returns are ex expensive. Not only the cost of the re reverse logistics themselves, but also what can happen to these products, and of course the poor customer experience. Uh, either it's delayed, or customers that need to uh, reorder, or they then uh, decide not to purchase at all. So overall, a very poor customer experience. Um, yeah. yeah. So our, our priority, you know, like every retailer, is to resell these returned items, and, and we do either new uh, or, or as used, and then we or we donate them to to charities. Um, you know, last year, for example, um, across Europe, customers bought over 10 million opened or or, or used products. Um, so it's really part of our business. We do very well at it, um, uh, but we, it's always going to be here. So it's not about avoiding them or stopping them. It's about how you manage it. So we, we focus a lot on returns prevention because obviously the best return is, is no return at all. So how do we do that? You know, first thing is we encourage selling partners to, to add photographs on the detailed page to help customers see the product in real life situations. Um, and we, um, we give them a lot of advice um, in terms of um, 
how the how you would where you would put it on the detail page, um, how you can better describe colors or textures or shapes or, or silhouettes. Uh, we also a long time ago enabled customer feedback, uh, where we're able to uh, you know uh, enable customers to give reviews or to add comments, which allows other customers to read what other customers say about a product or service, which helps them make a, a better and more informed uh, decision. On fashion items, we, we have even more structured and more depth in the feedback, uh, because that's one of the areas where the, traditionally there are a lot more returns, particularly on sizes or, or colors or things like that. Um, in there, we can actually, customers can put their, their height and weight, which also helps customers wanting to buy to filter these reviews by heights and weight to help other customers who are a similar shape make um, make better purchases and then we also have a, a q a feature where customers can ask customers other other questions or or direct to the vendor or seller you know for and i used that myself just relatively recently when i needed a bike rack for my bike but i wasn't too sure whether that bike rack would fit it would uh, uh, attach to mine so i left a question on the q a and within an hour I, I got an answer from the from the seller confirming that it would indeed uh, fit my bike. Um, so effectively, that's what we uh, we we try to do on 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 the, the sort of store itself. Uh, being Amazon, and one of the benefits of e-commerce is using the data that we have to to inform both uh, and remove errors and defects in the process in the store, and also then to use it to to give a different shopping experience and and re really reduce the amount of returns. So the first area is we return we analyze returns data to improve all the size recommendations because you as everybody finds and particularly with an international and a global business sizes change in different countries and different markets um, and so having an ability to um, help sellers and, and vendors improve their size resume recommendations um, to, to, to improve them is, is, is really important uh, and we work very closely at scale uh, based on all the historical per, uh, purchases and, and, and uh, returns to help ensure better fits um, so you know a customer um, who, who for example, um, bought something that was similar size to you um, because of your history, it will then flag and say, uh, we recommend that your size is a large based on our, our, the other customer data. And we also have begun to use augmented reality. So it's particular for furniture, but we are working in other categories like eyewear. And this is where you can actually put um, uh, furniture in a place in your home and you can see what it looks like. You can change the angle, you can change the color, you can move it around your house. Um, so you can really make sure before you buy it. And the same with eyewear. You're able to put some sort of sunglasses or glasses on your face to make sure they suit you before you purchase. So effectively, all of these items, working with sellers and vendors and working with all the data to improve the whole process, uh, we've really sort of reduced a lot of the returns that come to us. Um, and so our returns currently are about three times lower uh, than average. Yeah, thank you very much for, for these insights um into amazon's preventive returns management and we'll now look a bit uh, at the other side with you alex and uh, look at what we can do with returns returned items that are coming back in and what advice you as flybay have for our audience today and how they can improve their processes the floor is yours uh, thank you aline uh, thank you richard um uh, let's hope murphy's law doesn't strike uh, cologne now um I think, uh, yeah, Richard had, had the, the uh, nice situation that he didn't have to introduce Amazon because we all know them. Uh, of course, uh, I work for Byway and hopefully in two or three years, we don't have to introduce ourselves as well. But for now, I think uh, it's good to, to maybe uh, say who we are and what we do. I'll also, so who's Bybay? We are a specialist in returns management um, in the grading part and all, as well as in the sales part. Um, of returned items and also of overstock items. Uh, why did we choose to uh, yeah, treat those very difficult products? Because we are on a mission and our mission is to reduce waste in e-commerce and uh, thus have a positive contribution um, uh, towards the climate. And uh, as we all know, these are difficult products that often um, are wasted or where the potential is not really uh, lifted and we want to change that. And every employee at Bybay uh, we are 250 growing fast, 
um, is really motivated to come uh, to work on a daily basis to, uh, to, to fight this fight, basically. Um, we have just yesterday been declared um, one of the fastest growing companies in the Netherlands, and now we're expanding uh, across Europe. We started in Germany last year and we'll uh, tackle other countries soon. Um, and we really think we have a very inno innovative approach in how to look at returns. Um, and the good thing is, and this is something where, where Richard and I uh, agree, is that we believe that uh, for returns, we're in a very good situation that um, the most profitable way to handle returns is also the most sustainable one. And um, I will get to why that is uh, during my presentations on the Q&A. Uh, why is returns relevant? Uh, Richard already said it's just part of the business. Uh, there's almost no e-commerce company uh, that doesn't have uh, to handle with this issue. Um, rarely it's an issue that people uh, look at and, and have a smile on their face. Um, but we truly believe that we can uh, switch this situation and, and uh, show companies how to get the best of their return products. Of course, we're just um, ahead of peak season and um, it's only logical that peak season of uh, online sales is also announcing the peak season of returns. Um, but there are some special factors why it, it, it's especially difficult during this time of year to, to handle the returns that you get. Apart from the high number of, of sales that cause more returns, um, especially during Black Friday, you have a lot of offers that almost provoke returns um, by campaigns that like order now, decide later whether you want to keep it and pay later. Uh, you have, especially of course during Christmas, uh, online sales that you do for a different person then they don't like the product. So the return rate in general increases. And you have the um, very challenging situation that you have the cyber week um, peak. And just after this peak, you have the Christmas peak and the Christmas peak is actually the time when the cyber week returns come in. So you basically have two peaks on top of each other in a warehouse that is already very, very busy fulfilling the Christmas orders. Um, and this often leads to, to a messy and chaotic situations within the warehouses. So uh, we urge every retailer to really think ahead and um, really plan what you want to do with the items that you get returned um, after uh, Black Friday and Christmas. And as I said, um, and I will show this, that, that the good thing is if you think ahead, it's not only going to solve the mess in your warehouse, it will also create an additional profit uh, for your balance sheet and it will um, result in less waste and, and a better contribution to the environment. Um, now, Richard focused on how to prevent returns, and we totally agree that the best return is no return at all. I would say the second best return is a return that can more or less immediately be restocked because basically the package wasn't even open. Um, however, obviously you, you have a rest, so you have a bunch of returns where there are some clear signs of usage. You cannot use those products as new anymore, and you need to find a solution to those. Um, I will, in, in my next slide, focus on the process, how to handle returns, but it's actually important to keep in mind that first you need to think about what you want to do with the returns in the end, and that basically defines the process. Uh, we as Byway, we are uh, specialized in low value returns as much as high value returns, but where the, the challenge really lies is with those high value returns, where you can actually uh, create a lot of uh, profit from them, but you need to really take care of the process to get there. And this is the process that I'm uh, about to show you now. So we um, have a big warehouse in the Netherlands. Uh, we work with e-tailers that uh, deliver their returned items in bulk to us. And I want to show you the journey such a return takes once it arrives at our warehouse, because it already shows a lot of what you should be thinking about. So this, this is a warehouse. The returns, as I said, they come in bulk uh, in truckloads. Um, and the first thing that we do after we, we receive the returns that have been announced to us, we, we get them at inbound, we count them. Every return gets a license plate that is unique. So we only treat unique items. And uh, those items will also get a category. And this category determines where this uh, specific product is um, going at within our warehouse. We have 
uh, yeah, dozens of grading stations that are equipped for those specific product categories. And there a grader um, gets the return and they will have a handheld that will tell them exactly which steps to take in order to grade, um, inspect, uh, clean and process this item. And of course, this is very diverse depending on uh, product category. There are large items that you need to treat differently, uh, that small items, electronic items need to um, be taken care of, need, to, need functional tests. And one very important thing, of course, that we see more and more data carriers and those data carriers need a um, wiping that is according to European law. That's what you see here. One thing that uh, we really emphasize in our warehouse, and you saw that a few seconds ago, is that of all optical um, uh, signs, uh, traces of usage, we do take individual photos because that is the key to selling those um, products online later. Um, because when you talk about selling imperfect products, the most important thing you need to be aware of if you want to sell them B2C is that the consumer knows exactly what they're buying so that when they get the product, they are their expectations are met and they're not um, dissatisfied and return the product once more because that will create obviously um, a, a vicious circle that you don't want to enter. So that's already one, one key learning um, that you need to be prepared for within your returns management process. Um, this is just a, a, another visual um, example of all the steps that you should think about within your grading process uh, when handling a return. And of course, not every step has to be taken for each product. A check mark here symbolizes that you can basically um, uh, overstep this, this part of the process. Um, and I will explain in a second. We here see three technical high value items. So we um, think that those items are best uh, to sell on marketplaces, even though they have been returned. But to do so, you need to test uh, and grade them. Um, and when you do that, you realize that, for example, for this first item, the coffee machine, uh, only the box has been opened um, and is maybe a little bit damaged, but the product in the box is as new. Uh, whereas for this blender, you see some light uh, indication of usage. And for this tablet, you actually see that it's been uh, more heavily used. And this grade, the status of the product then determines what needs to happen. So a good as new product can skip uh, testing, cleaning, and repair. In this case, you only need to replace the original box. Um, and then you can basically put it online again, uh, say that it has a, um, a basically, it's a new product. Um, so you can sell it as an A grade, um, and the product is sold for the normal price. In this case, you do see some signs of usage, which makes it important that you document those uh, signs of usage and um, then you can sell it on online marketplaces or your own web shop. But of course, you need to make sure if you sell it yourself that you also take care of customer questions. So you do have your customer service also prepared to, to handle those returned items. And uh, in the case that there are some heavier signs of usage, and in this specific case where you have a data carrier, you need to make sure to wipe that data. You need to clean that product a bit. Um, and then you need to really make sure that you document uh, you do a functional test of the product. You understand what is the um, battery capacity, for example, and then you need to describe the product before you sell it so that um, uh, the customer in the end is happy. The question always is to what price can I, can I sell my product? And here, obviously, you also need to consider the demand of that product and the state of that product uh, before setting a price. But we highly also recommend with um, auctioning or using auction um, techniques to get to the highest price. So we, for example, use a pricing algorithm that will, for a unique product, always start with the normal price and then uh, drops on a daily basis a, a tiny little bit. And this way, it's kind of like a reversed auction where um, a consumer at some point sees this product, sees the state of the product, sees a price, and is uh, happy to buy it. And therefore, we can, we can generate the most of it. Um, that, is, that is about the process. Uh, of course, there are lots of other things to highlight, but uh, I think now it's time for, for Q&A.
you were like already mentioning the peak times that are just ahead of us with Black Friday, with the Cyber Week and Christmas. And um, you said that as a seller, you should prepare for this. Can you give some advice to our audience today on, on how to prepare best for this season? And maybe you can also tell us in what way this preparation might differ or your recommendations might differ from the recommendations that you would give for normal times. Yeah, I mean, I already mentioned briefly uh, why, uh, of course, Q4 is not only the peak season for sales, but also for returns. Um, and there are other reasons than just more, more sales cause more returns. Um, uh, my experience from talking to, to a lot of retailers is that, and, and knowing this ourselves, because we're also a seller, of course, is that uh, during Q4, every hand you, you have, you basically need to, to fulfill um, all the orders that come in. So you really, um, you're, in, you're also in, in, in holiday season. So really it's a, a messy, it's a very uh, chaotic time in your warehouse. Um, space is, is even more limited uh, compared to other times of the year. So you really need to think ahead of what you want to do with the products that get returned. Because if you don't think ahead, you will be overwhelmed with those products. Uh, the likelihood is, is pretty high that you just stack them somewhere in the corner that is free. And then once this busy time is, is over, you look at that corner and you don't even know where to start. And the issue here is that depending on, on your product portfolio, there are a lot of products that, that um, lose value rapidly. So um, this, this is not just a matter of operational performance. It's also really a matter of value and, and thus a matter of uh, profit in the end. Um, and the likelihood that you then uh, in March look at a product and, and you see it's a, it's a winter tire, for example, that you, you are going to dispose it is higher compared when you were, would have actually um, processed that good already in, in winter when you could still resell it as a B grade. Um, I am aware that now it's probably too, too late to set up a process. Best case would obviously to have a smooth process before the peak season that can just run through the peak season. Um, now, time being scarce, it's still, I think, important to, to think about what could come back and maybe to set some priorities um, and at least think about what do I want to do with those products from product categories that lose high value rapidly and, and assign some resources to handle those products, whereas the products that you can sell uh, all year, you, you actually find to stock them for a bit. Um, actually, yeah, just adding to this, because you were already mentioning that um, different products, different product categories might have also different requirements on how they are handled, like also how much time I have to handle them or what is need to be done in order to refurbish these goods. Um, can you tell us a bit more about if there are any products or product categories that are selling better via certain sales channels or is it all the same, basically? No, that's actually, it's, it's very different. And it's uh, actually the first question you should ask yourself when thinking about um, implementing a returns management process, because uh, the, the sales channel that you want to use uh, de determines the process that you need to implement. Um, disposing the items should always be the, the last resort. There will always be items that are so broken that there's just no value in it. But even then, you should think about the most sustainable way to, to dispose of them, to recycle them. Um, but if you want to get value out of them, uh, from our point of view, you can either sell them in bulk. That's what most ETLs do. They, they use bulk buyers where they just stack them on pallets and, and sell them for a pretty low price. Uh, there's the opportunity to sell it on your own web shop if you have one. Um, and there's the opportunity to sell it via marketplaces, uh, for example, Amazon, eBay, and others. And um, to give some examples, uh, the, the marketplaces in your own web, web shop are definitely the ones that will create the, the best price for you, um, even though, but they are a bit cost, more cost intensive because then you will need to uh, set up a grading process to not sell off broken items and get them returned again. Um, so we basically define a price point of 70 euros and above that make this process um, uh, uh, yeah, efficient. Um, However, the products need to check some other um, criteria. They need to be in demand. Uh, so good brands, uh, the price point I already mentioned, um, 
and of course you need to be able to treat the the, um, the whole portfolio um, as I, as you saw in the video washing machines need to be treated differently than than tablets for example um, for lower valued items uh, we believe that selling them to to bulk buyers that are specialized in those product categories are a good way because in that way you reduce your handling costs but you can still um, uh, get quite a good um, margin from them and then uh, of course there if you're treating uh, or if you're dealing with with items that have an expiry date i think in germany um, is also the option to donate some of them um, and and uh, work for a good cause on, on this end which is still better than, than um, disposing them so in the end you need to think about what, what are my products what is the value what is the demand um, choose one of those sales channels and then set up the process according to that sales channel all right, and I mean, I could imagine just from a business perspective right now that um, some of our um, participants could basically think, okay, if I'm now selling refurbished goods um, as B crates, do I then not hurt the sale of the new products or the A crates that I'm selling as well? What would be your answer to this? Yeah, um, in the in a very uh, individual case, it, it can happen that, uh, uh, for example, if you sell um, returned items also on your web page, that someone that searched for a new product will be diverted to to this returned item, and uh, you will have created uh, a small loss compared to when when that person would have uh, bought the, the A grade. However, um, the loss will be minimal if you do it right, because we, on average, we resell returned items for 80% or more of the original value. Um, but I, what I would actually answer um, uh, to this is that what we see is that you attract new customers. Uh, I think Richard said that more and more people um, are looking for, for B grades, are looking for returned items, are uh, either for, for pricing reasons or um, more and more for sustainability reasons. So. When you do start selling those B grades, you attract a totally new target group. And I think in the end, this will have an, actually a very positive um, uh, effect on, on your balance sheet. And uh, maybe as a, as a last question to sum up, I mean, you, you said this already, but um, you know, maybe you can just make this point once more. So how does having an efficient returns management process in place help to contribute to sustainability overall? Yeah. Um, uh, that's basically the statement I started with. I think that uh, the great uh, situation for us uh, being, being uh, in this business only is that um, the most profitable solution is usually the most sustainable one because the, uh, the more profitable is always B2C. So if you sell it directly to a consumer, that is usually in your vicinity. So in the area that you originally sell, the second most profitable approach is usually selling to bulk buyers, which might then export the goods. And the least profitable solution is uh, disposing the items. And if you think about that, uh, all you have to do is think about what is most profitable for my, uh, for my company, because that will equal what is most sustainable. So that's actually a nice situation. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is uh, a very interesting. Um, keep um, um, on basically as they want. Um, we'll turn now to Richard. We have heard a lot now about how companies handle returns and also what measures they have in place to avoid them in the first place. Um, however, we also know that after having applied all these measures, there will still be a very small share of returns that are left and that cannot simply be resold. Could you maybe tell us what is happening with this small share? Yes. Now, as um, as we sort of heard uh, in the, in this session so far, um, effectively we we try to reduce all the upstream ones, and then when they arrive, just as Alexander went through, we grade. Um, you know, some of those are returned to the store, others are repair, repaired and resell. And in Amazon, we have warehouse deals where we we discount um, depending on the grade that they are. Um, and if we can't sell them through that, then we put them through, again, as Alexander said, bulk resale, where we're able to put them under pallets or into large boxes and, and sell them to sort of bulk uh, companies that then can resell them on or even harvest them for, for spare parts, depending on 
uh, the the products and, and the state that they're, that, that they're in. What we tend to do globally after that is, is donate. Um, and, and this is where, of course, um, different, different countries have different laws. In the US, for example, and the UK, um, the, the, the ability to donate is, is, is actually what we call zero rate for GST or zero rate for sales tax or zero rate uh, for VAT, which means that the sellers or the, or the vendors or, or the companies don't then pay the VAT on the sales price uh, as, they, as they donate that. In Germany, like Spain, um, Italy's just changed their laws and, and France just changed them about two years ago. Um, effectively, when you donate something to a charity, you need to pay the VAT, which is 19%, I believe, in Germany, 20% in, in, in other sort of co countries. And that makes it quite tough for companies to do that. Um, and, and so when you go down the value chain and you come to you can't bulk resell it, then you have to pay 20% on the sales price to donate it. Many of those sellers and vendors are choosing um, to, to recycle. Um, and then that, I think, is the wrong sustainable outcome uh, for, for many companies. So that's an area which we've been working with public policy in Germany and in Spain, uh, and actually to, to try and see if we can uh, change the, some of the, the laws there. But effectively, that, that's the sort of flow that we try to get. We try to maximize a, a market or an end um, state for, for the products themselves, um, uh, try to donate or rehome them for free. And if we can't do that, uh, then it's the recycling uh, area that we wanted to go to. So that, that's the sort of flow down. And, and in Germany in particular, it's the donations or the zero rate piece of it, which is uh, a bit of a, um, a hurdle at this time. And uh, are there any other areas um that could help to reduce the disposal of goods or materials as well? Yes, I mean, as I said, even if we, if we you know, if we fix, I think donations is so much better than going to recycling. I mean, in terms of a circular economy, um, the sort of lowest sort of um, form of, of circularity is recycling, because effectively you're, you're dissembling the product you're, you're, you're removing the value of that of the product itself and you, then you're looking at the materials and of course you have to ship it to the recycler the recycler has to dissemble it the site recycler has to reprocess it and then we have to find an end market for the feedstock all of those are, are sort of adding to the carbon footprint and destroying even economic value in that process um, so those are elements that we would really like to um uh, avoid so donations would be the big one however we'll always have some of the flow which will end up not even we're not able to be donated either it's ex expired food or it's uh, there's a hazardous or there's dangerous goods or there's some eligibility issue that which means we can't sell it so then it's finding the right recycler now europe itself has a very fragmented recycling market it, they tend to be small uh, they tend to specialize in certain areas uh, in, in typically big bulk so they'll do cardboard paper glass uh, plastic bottles but then when you look at products themselves products have to be dissembled they have many different components uh, that uh, need to be shredded and sorted you know you need to minimize contamination because that ruins the grade of the final material that you'll look to sell back into someone's supply chain um, and so there's some areas there where we, we're trying to work with recyclers and across and also countries as well to try and improve that recycling infrastructure. One, to make sure recyclers see value in investing in looking at products themselves rather than the big bulk materials I just, I just discussed, but also governments. And, you know, all the people in this call will probably have a different, you know, experience at home, even with their recycling infrastructure. What is curbside in one local authority or municipality may not be curbside in another. How do I, when I look at a pizza box that says I can recycle that, um, but then you, you read your recycling rules and it says if it's got food on it, you can't do it. How do I deal with those sort of materials? And there is a lot of confusion, a lack of consistency. Um, and so what Amazon's trying to do is not just think about Amazon themselves, but actually what we can do for the, for the sort of uh, the greater good. So working with recyclers to try and focus them away from their big bulk uh, focus today into more special value added services of which we're willing to participate and help them grow, 
but then secondly working with governments and regional authorities and local authorities to kind of say we need a better system to be able to take the plastics and the products and and make sure that you pick them up and you give them to the right person and how we kind of make sure that flow that 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 happens you know the one lovely thing about circular car circle circle economy is the beauty of the circle but the the weakness of it is if there's one block anywhere along that flow the the whole concept dies if we can't recycle things and it's um and get the feedstock back in the supply chain, the loop stops. And so that's what we're keenly doing is we're looking at upstream, as we talked about, we're looking at returns management, then we're looking at the donations piece, looking at the recycling, and then actually, even in the recycling piece, we'll probably then look further, and we're already beginning to measure that, which is what are recyclers doing with those materials? Are they selling them? where are they selling them to? Now, we don't need to know the, their, their final customer, but we're keen to measure the efficiency of the recycling process to make sure we can start to, again, push recyclers to raise the yields from 50% to 80% or whatever. So those are the sort of areas where we're beginning to look at, taking circle economy in its purest form, looking all the way around that circle to sort of, you know, like almost a theory of constraint and supply chain management. We're looking at all the pinch points around that flow and trying to find ways to overcome them. And then being Amazon and e-commerce, how to scale them. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Also, like this opening up um, to the recycling process. I think uh, this is a way we have uh, rarely looked at this topic so far. I would like to thank both of you for having been with us. It was uh, very interesting with you. Um, thank you for sharing your insights. And I also hope that some of the policy makers might have listened and that they will also support the further reduction of goods and materials that companies still have to get disposed of. Um, for sure, this is a topic, returns is a topic that will not disappear and that will remain challenging for retailers. But I think thanks to your presentations and insights um, that you shared um, also from the inside of your businesses, um, our members um, can now get a better impression on how they could prevent and how they could deal with returns, how they can prepare also for the peak seasons that are just ahead of us. Um, thank you very much also to all of the participants and uh, for your attention and uh, see you next time. Prepare for the peak seasons and have a great rest of the day. Thank okay. you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.